my name is Christian Maguire. Uh, I work at a software agency uh, it's called Software Mention uh, in Cracker Poland. Um, we're around 30 people now in use React and related technologies in many other projects. Uh, so prior to that, uh, I was at Facebook working on the React Native Core Android team almost since the project started. I left December last year, and since then it's also contributing um, to some extent. Um, so, uh, so my area of expertise is React Native, and that's what my talk is going to be about today. Um, so since I recently uh, switched from being like a framework developer to more work, work on the products, and also mentoring other people who use React Native for the first time, um, I started noticing uh, like the, the common source of uh, confusion when it comes to React Native as the asynchronous native, uh, nature of the bridge. So today I'm going to talk about some common patterns for dealing with issues that are induced by the asynchronous nature and, and the design and implementation of the React Native core. Um, so you're going to see that a lot. I'm kind of assuming that you know a little about React Native already. Um, so, so this is like a, a template for uh, for how I'm going to be talking about the interaction between the threads in React Native. Uh, so on the on the left hand side you have a JavaScript thread which runs JavaScript code. That's kind of obvious. On the right hand side uh, there is a UI thread which is like the main uh, native application thread that handles all the input and also is responsible for um, for rendering uh, native views. And the native thread is kind of in the middle and it's responsible for communication between these two, these two and also for uh, for calculating the layout. And the time goes from up to. Uh, but let's start with a simple example. Let's talk about the async storage. So imagine you want to build an app that gives a user a nice onboarding experience. So whenever they launch the app for the first time, they see the onboarding screen. And if they, they have already went through the onboarding, then they can like just turn to the, the main app immediately. So you're going to have like a, a variable that you could store in like a local storage. And then we're going to read it at the beginning. And then decide, uh, depending on the results, you're going to either render the main application or render the onboarding component. Um, so as you might already know, there is no like, a web uh, version of local storage API on, on uh, Bridge Native. And this, uh, the reason, of course, is the asynchronous nature of the bridge. So there is an uh, alternative API that's called async storage. Um, uh, and this is how the, the interaction with the async storage would look like on the uh, on this uh, load track. Uh, so on the JavaScript thread, you're going to ask the async storage to get an item with the with the given key. It's going to go to the native thread that runs the native modules, and the native thread will actually reach out to the uh, to the actual storage, and find the value, and return it back to the JavaScript. Then, depending on on the results, we are going to render the main app or the onboarding screen, and then it will go back to the uh, to the native thread. The native thread will do the layout thing and then render it on the UI thread. So the issue here is that in the meantime, uh, there is nothing that your app can actually render. Uh, so, so it would be much easier for us to actually be able to read it synchronously than asynchronously. So that again actually show the uh, the results at the application startup. Because uh, native apps, native app will give you like a native um, uh, like a native version of a loading screen, but then once once the, the JavaScript app kicks out, then it's going to re be replaced with whatever your app returns. Um, and it's also very convenient to actually be able to have like access to some simple values synchronously. So, so this first button um, describes how to uh, build a synchronous version of the bridge. It's actually commonly used in the React Native Core, for example, for the module that's called App State. So it works by exporting, um, by creating a separate native module that then you can use to export constants to the JavaScript. So these constants are loaded on the third of time and then are accessible synchronously. So you could build it uh, in, in iOS Android using these methods in your native module code and then, uh, then, then use the get constant method to return the, the list of, of things you want to access from the JavaScript. And then in JavaScript you use the native modules module to, to require your uh, to, to get the reference to that uh, to that constants, and then whenever you want to get the item, you just get them synchronously from whatever you have um, uh, from the copy that you have in the JavaScript VM. And then when you set it, you set it synchronously, and then send an async, async update to the native module. Uh, next up is the, the screen orientation. Um, so there there is one library that's called React Native Orientation. Uh, it helps with handling orientation changes. Uh, it works. It actually follows similar pattern, so it, it exports a synchronous version of the initial orientation. You can access that on the startup, and then you can also register for orientation uh, change updates. 
and then you get whether it's if you flip from portrait to landscape or from landscape to portrait and vice versa. So there's also undocumented feature in React Native Core. It works only for Android um, and, and it works through the device event emitter. There is an example up in the Red Pen Core if you're interested in using that. Um, so this is this is a good solution for uh, for in many cases where you, you're just interested in the uh, what type of orientation you have. But if you are actually trying to build a different experience depending on the orientation, it, you might get into trouble. So imagine you have two apps, like one app that has two versions of it, depending on if you're in landscape or in, uh, in portrait. So in portrait, you have a list of items, and then when you flip to the landscape, you have like a um, like a view pager that you can flip between the slides and you can see my nice full screen picture. Um, so what happens when the orientation change comes to the uh, to the URL thread? We send the event to the JavaScript thread, right? So and depending on that, if if the, the orientation change to landscape or portrait, we will render landscape view or the portrait view, right? So the problem here is that it actually uh, the event is also sent to the native thread because the the size and the dimension of the screen changed. So the native thread will do rely out, and it will actually, after relighting, uh, will also update the UI. Um, so then, of course, uh, the render in JavaScript will also uh, send some UI updates to the native thread, and then layout will run again, and it will render. Um, so what happens here might be uh, something we would like to avoid. So let's see, I prepared an example where I added like an extra computation that would um, that would make it easier to, to notice. And whenever we flip, it actually flips first and relays out, and then there's a delay between we actually see whatever we wanted to see. So this is an undesirable behavior, right? Um, yeah, so, so to fix it, it's actually pretty easy. So the pattern here is to actually move the control over whoever is uh, controlling uh, what type of orientation we're showing, to move the control from being distributed between the JavaScript and native, to move it to be only in JavaScript. So whenever we launch the application, we can just tell the application to lock on this initial orientation. So now when we are going to be rotating the screen, uh, the, the UI won't really update automatically. Uh, and then whenever we get the orientation change event, so we flip to the landscape, for example, um, the, the app won't flip because it's locked. We will get the event, and then we can lock to the, to the landscape. And then uh, in the JavaScript, we already have the information about what, what is the next uh, orientation going to be. So, so we can we can uh, execute all the updates in a single JavaScript loop and update the UI at all at once. Uh, so then, in the render, we will we will use the state uh, depending on, on the state we will render one or the other. Um, yeah. uh, the next thing I, I'd like to talk about uh, are animations. Uh, so, a very popular library for um, making animations in React Native is called Animated JS. Um, so the API looks like, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the API. Um, so it works by creating animated values that have like a numeric values assigned to them. Um, so you create value like this, and then uh, instead of using a classic views or tags or images, you use a animated wrappers around those views, so for example animated.view, and this wrapper allows you to put uh, as a property, put one of the animated values. So instead of using like a a constant for the opacity, we can actually use the reference to the animated value. Mm. And then we can start the animation using uh, using different uh, animation curves, so for example spring, then we pass the value that we want to animate, and then some conflict for the, for the, for the animation, so for example the destination value and friction in case of spring, there are some other types. Um, so, so how does that work in terms of the communication between the threads? So first we start the animation in JavaScript thread, uh, it goes to the native and sets the timeout because it needs to execute uh, operation after some time to update, uh, to update the animation loop. So after some time, timer fires off and it goes back to the JavaScript thread with an event, with a timer event, and then JavaScript runs the animation loop. And the animation loop might update some, some UI, so, so we'll get updates for the UI manager module, and then it will end it up um, rendering something on the UI thread. And th this will happen again and again because there is a next frame to render and so on and so forth. Uh, so as you may already see, the problem here is that we're really doing a lot of small operations in JavaScript. And if there happens to be something more important for the JavaScript to do, 
then it, we, we might basically not find time for, time to do that, or uh, the, the animation would like start losing frames because it won't be able to keep up with, with the updates. So here's another example where you can see this uh, on switching the, between the um, different views. So here, the, the complex operation is that we actually need to render the next screen, and there is this animation between the, the two the states. So I actually, also for this example, I added extra code that actually burns the CPU just, to, just for, for the example to be cleaner, right? Um, so, so yeah, this is again on the server. Um, so, so one of the solutions for that is the um, property that is called use, uh, use native driver, and this is something I've talked about on the React New Europe, so I, I can recommend my talk from React New Europe about the implementation data behind that. And the way it works, it actually, since the animated API is, um, um, is declarative, we can actually uh, copy the whole description of how the animated nodes interact with each other, we can move it to the native thread, and then run the animation in the UI thread. So this actually, that's exactly that. Um, there are some limitations, so I, I recommend watching my talk if you guys are interested in um, how it exactly works and what the limitations come from. Um, and the last thing I'd like to talk about today are uh, patch events and, and gesture handling. So if you look at the flowchart, um, as I mentioned earlier, UI thread is the one responsible for getting all the input from, uh, from different uh, devices, like, like for example the touch screen. So the, the, uh, the touch event will first arrive at the UI thread. Um, and what happens then is we're going to send the event to the JavaScript thread, and there is like some we, we can define a handler to, to handle this gesture somehow. So we can use like touchable elements or pan responder. There are many different options. Um, so as a result of handle touch, we may want to update some views, and this will go through the UI manager and go back to the UI thread uh, and render the update. So this is not actually that simple, so I'm going to focus a little bit more about this uh, on this topic. So here we have like just the UI thread and the JavaScript thread, um, and we have this touch that happened in the UI thread and the event that has been sent to the JavaScript. Um, so the, the, the issue here is that the UI thread is actually like the timeline is, is um, divided into frames, and that uh, should should like preferably happen uh, 16 times per second. Um, and what happens here is that like whenever a UI thread is finished with, um, um, with handling all the input information, it will immediately start composing the frame because it doesn't really know how long does it would it take to render the, the, the update of the, for the frame. So it starts that immediately after the input has been handled. So even if the, even if the procedure in the JavaScript is very short, it will never be able to return before the end of the frame. And so whenever the, the handle touch will, uh, whatever the output of the handle touch will be, it will execute in the next frame. So then the rendering will happen and also composing the frame. So there is always this one frame delay between, between in related between handling the touch and actually what will happen on the screen. Uh, so this is in, in fact very hard, hard to notice in many cases, but there are some cases that, um, that makes it easier to, to, to notice. One of those cases is when we want to have um, a navigation bar that collapses when, when we're scrolling. So then we have scroll events that we want to uh, convert into like the position or the opacity of, uh, of the navigation bar. I also added some extra code here just to make it look worse. Uh, and this is what you might be able to see sometimes. So there is like this delay between, um, between uh, the, the action that the navigator, uh, the, the navigation bar uh, is taking and whatever is on the scroll. So the scrolling is smooth, but the, the navigation bar is jittering. Um, so yeah, of course, undesirable behavior. So, so one of the ways of dealing with this problem is by using animated again. Um, so here we can implement this by um, using animated event to, as a scroll handler. So this works in a way that animated events allows us to map anything that is, has been delivered as a uh, payload of an event to some animated value. So here we map uh, whatever is in an event under a field native event, then under content offset and dot y. We map that to the animated value that is, scroll, and that is called scroll y. Um, so this will give us uh, this result, and 
um, just thanks to some recent updates in React Native, we can also use the native driver with this. Um, so, so this will allow us to actually run this whole interaction between the scroll and and the position of a navigation bar and UI thread. Um, so, so this is the last thing I'd like to talk about, and it's also related to uh, to touch, uh, but it's it's more about like just gesture handling. So imagine that you uh, that you want to build a app where you have a scroll view with a button in it. Uh, pretty simple case, right? So um, let's let's talk a little bit about like how this can be handled in JavaScript. Um, so um, so in, in React Native, there are the the gesture handling is sort of split between UI thread and JavaScript thread. So there are some gestures that are recognized in the UI thread, so like, like for example scroll events, and then there are some gestures that are recognized in the JavaScript thread, like like tap events. So, for example, you can use touchable, or you can use pan responder, which recognizes pan gestures. Um, so, so for this to work, um, let's let's uh, see how it looks on the flowchart. So, we receive the touch event, uh, touchdown event in UI thread, and then there is this scroll view that has a logic that tells, like, when whenever we recognize the scroll. Uh, so we send this touch event as well to the JavaScript, and JavaScript has its own handler, and there is, for example, touchable, so we started the event on the button, and then we tried to scroll for it. Let's, let's assume that we're trying to do that. So then there are other move events, so we're, we're moving around and trying to drag the finger up, and then at some point, the scroll recognizer, recognizer managed to recognize the gesture. So what happens then, it actually sends, it starts sending scroll events now, and uh, uh, the JavaScript um, recognizer can and can cancel uh, the, the, the gesture recognizing process. So now the touchable is canceled and the scroll scroll is scrolling. So let's now imagine. Uh, so let's now see what happens when we just like pull the, put the finger down on the button, then move a little bit, but not like not vertically, but horizontally, and then lift it up. So we should expect the uh, the, the touchable to actually fire the click event. So we have a touchdown event. It's again sent to the uh, JavaScript then when handle touch is uh, operating on touchable. And then we have a couple of move events. And then at the end, we have touch up because someone lifted the finger up. So whenever we get the touch up, Pro Recognizer hasn't yet recognized the event. So it, it gets canceled. It sends the touch event to JavaScript and JavaScript touchable. If the touch is in within the area of the button, it will recognize the, the touch event. So this, this works perfectly. In, in React Native, so you can like start your drag on the button, then drag it, and the button will cancel. You can also click on the button, and it will fire the, the event. Um, so the thing is that this is like very simple example. So let's see what happens when we have something more complex. So let's consider a scroll view with a, a slider in it. So the slider will be driven by the time responder. Um, so we have a touchdown event, then it's sent to handler. In JavaScript, in, instead of touchable, now we have pan responder. Uh, so pan responder receives this event. There are more move events, so we are moving moving the finger around. And the issue is that we can never really like scroll exactly horizontally or like very precisely ver in, in vertical direction. But there's always some component in perpendicular direction. Um, and thanks to that, there is a chance that both scroll and recognizer could recognize the event. So what happens now is that let's say the, the last move event made, made the scroll recognize and recognize. So we will we will supposedly start canceling the JS recognizer. But the thing is that JS recognizer is like running in parallel in a different thread. So it might actually be uh, a, a thing that the, the gestures that has already been sent to JavaScript are enough for the JavaScript to recognize the event. So they can sort of Simultaneously recognize the uh, different different gestures, and this is what happens in the case to like end up panning the slider and also scrolling the scroll view, which is also undesirable, right? Um, so, so I've been prototyping a solution that has been inspired by Andy Matushak talk from Lightning talk from the ReactJS Conf in uh, in January this year. Um, and the solution it, here is like to try to do the same as we did with animated. That would be like move the logic between about like who should be able, uh, who should be responsible for recognizing the gesture, to move it to the UI thread so that it can be executed without communicating with JS very much. 
Um, so the library is called Gesture Handling, a rate native gesture handler, um, and it, at the moment it's, it's like a very experimental state. Um, works for Android only, um, and, and here's, I just wanted to give you an overview on the API. So, so we have a couple of different components responsible for recognizing the gestures. One of them is the tab gesture, uh, tab gesture handler. So you can use tab gesture handler to implement a button. So inside of the gesture handler, we can have a view, and this view, depending on the state, if it's pressed or not pressed, then it, this, this view can display different, it can, can look different, right? Um, so for the handlers, we can, um, we can define two types of events that we receive through the gesture handlers. The one is the, the uh, event that uh, is um, generated whenever the gesture handler changes its state of recognition, and the second one is just for, the, for receiving this whole, the complete stream of, stream of uh, touch events. So in this case, we are only interested in changing the state. So we're, we're setting the handler, and then the logic would be like, we will set the state to pressed whenever the, the event, uh, the, the gesture recognizer, moves to a state that is called the begin, began. And then whenever it became active, it means that the uh, gesture has been recognized, then we will fire the click event. So this is a pretty simple implementation of the button uh, using the gesture handler API. Um, so we can also implement a draggable element. So let's consider a view. We will use animated for that. So the view will have translate x, translate y bound to two different animated values. So this is not interacting with any touch at the moment, but we can wrap it in the pan gesture handler. So the pan gesture handler, uh, for the pan gesture handler, we also use to uh, we also use the handler state change and the gesture event. So the gesture event is the one that receives all the, the, whole, the full stream of updates. Um, so now to implement that. Um, in on gesture event, we will what we will do. We will just take the translation that we made uh, uh, as the as the pan was happening. So we will set that for the translate x and translate y values. And then in on handler state, we're actually only interested whenever someone stopped um, moving the stop dragging the, the element around. So whenever you lift the finger, then the the old state was active and the new state is is whatever else. So when you stop, uh, when you stop dragging, we want to remember the offset and then reset the translate x and translate y, so that next time you start dragging, it will, it will, it can start by just applying the translation x translation y. So this is uh, one of the ways you can implement a dragon component using using this new API. Um, so another good thing about this is that like the, the gesture event handler is actually really simple, so we can we can just replace it with the animated event. And also, supposedly, we can use native driver for that. That will like move the whole uh, interaction to uh, be uh, done in the UI thread. So this, the, the, the last thing, the use native driver doesn't uh, work yet with without any changes in React Native core. Everything else is uh, like a standalone live library. Uh, so what else we can do with the API? You can nest uh, a gesture handlers. So if you're you you want to have like a long press, you want to have a tab, and also pan it. So you can you can do all of that. You can also like use attributes to to um, to change the default behavior of each of the recognizer. So for example, for the long press, you can set things like for example, how long would it take before the gesture is recognized? How long have you do you need to like keep your finger on the button? Uh, for the pan gesture, you can you can set what is the delta in the x direction before the the um, the event is recognized. Uh, so it's now GitHub and npm. Um, uh, if you're interested in that, you go check it out. And that's everything. Thank you. That's some time for questions. <laughs> Any questions? I don't think. <laughs> there are questions here. What would be the main takeaway from your talk, in your opinion? Um, so I was, I was kind of trying to talk about that at the beginning. So, um, so I think the main takeaway would be uh, like for people who are willing to, to work with React Native to know like what are some of the things, some of the issues that they can encounter, and also whenever they they encounter this type of issues, I hope that they can like remember that there was this talk on, on reactive count and maybe like look up the slides that I'm going to post. Um, so, so that's, uh, I hope that's answering the question.
uh, why is use native driver not the default behavior? But they, it, it is not a default behavior mainly because it has some limitations. Um, so, so there are a couple of um, features in the animated library that hasn't been yet implemented, so that they can use uh, they can be used natively. So that's that's one of the that's one of the main reasons I'd say. It seems to imply that uh, in order to build a solid app, you need to know the internal of the native. Does that defeat its purpose? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I kind of tried to imply that. That's that's true. Like, I mean, uh, the framework is it's still like pretty early state. Um, so, so whenever you you know, I mean, if you know more, then you you can basically do more, right? So it's it's also. Um, like, like hopefully the, the whole community is building up new libraries and they, they kind of uh, provide already good solutions for many of those situations. So for example, imagine in, in for example the case that I mentioned about the, the orientation change. If someone of you would like to, to build a better version of this library that would actually default to, uh, to the suggestion that I've made, that would be great. Right? And, and then it wouldn't really be necessary for everyone to, to know how um, how to deal with this kind of problem, um, and also you could you could like actually open source uh, the, the synchronous storage that I mentioned, or or like everything else that that I I tried to talk about during this talk. So the the, the new APIs are coming up, and and hopefully they're they're going to be better, um, and hopefully they're like over time it will really require less knowledge uh, from the framework side to, to work on their native projects. I have time for one more. Sure, you have time for more questions. Yeah, it seems we lost connection for the big screen, so I have it on my phone. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read it to you. Okay. All right. So are these kind of gotchas documented anywhere in a non-talk format? Since they seem to be a common challenge. Ah, I'm sorry. Can you? <laughs> so I will show it to you. So ah, all right. So number one. Are these kinds of gotchas documented anywhere in non-talk formats? Since they seem to be common challenges. Uh, yeah, there's. I mean, nothing that I know about, unfortunately. So, so no. I mean, they will be documented once I put up my slides up. <laughs> so, in your slides. So the next one is: I miss good documentation for React Native. What's the roadmap for the complete documentation? Yeah. So, uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm no longer a part of the React Native team. Uh, so it's difficult for me to speak about the uh, roadmap for, for the project. <laughs> Sorry. So you've just explained how to solve all our issues with React Native. We can give this presentation at least code snippets. I can answer that one. So it's already on live stream, and you can see the talks uh, pretty soon, like next week. It's going to be sliced into individual presentations. Yeah, I'm also going to post my slides on Twitter. So just you can you can check out my profile or my birthday. Next one: Will ES6 async await will uh, be available in React Native? It is kind of available already, um, so, so so you just need to have like a proper uh, trans transform for that. I personally don't use that, um, but we're already there. So go on with the answers. Yeah. So yeah, it is it is available. Whenever you I mean are willing to configure that, then then you can you can actually use that. And I mean it doesn't doesn't I mean async away doesn't really solve all those issues because you still have I mean even though your code looks like it is synchronous, it it is not. So. Um, so it actually can, in many cases, make things more complicated or not explicit in, in, case, in, in many cases. So a Facebook engineer is asking, what happens if async execution fails for some reason and you have to already, and you have already used the new value optimistically? Uh, yeah, I mean, that could happen. That's true. I mean, the, the only reason, I mean, there are just a few reasons why the, uh, why the async? I, I think you're referring to the async storage case here. So whenever you do the set, then it sets synchronously, and then you set it asynchronously. Uh, so I mean, there is there is no good answer for this. Um, so so you you can like um, expect the, the callback to return you um, like an error, and then you, from the JavaScript side you can try to handle it somehow. But it depends on my like, case by case. So in, in case of like having this constant uh, about the onboarding, it's not really very important because because uh, like next time you launch the app and the, the async execution failed, you just like show the onboarding screen. So it's not like that. Uh, and it's like very very important. 
case, but yeah, I can imagine that, that it, it might be an issue in, 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 in many different cases. So we have time for one last question. So do you have a demo for the log to original orientation solution? No, I, I, I don't have it, sorry. <laughs> that was a quick answer. Thank you so much. Brought up Thank you.